Um, hello, everyone. Uh, this event uh, is brought to you by Data Talks Club, which is a community of people who love data. And we have regular events on Tuesdays. We have uh, more technical events where we have some sort of presentation. It's a webinar. Um, we will not have any uh, next month because next month we will have a conference, which I'll talk about uh, soon. But in March, we will be back with technical meetups and we will talk the first uh, Meetup in March will be about building scalable scalable end-to-end -end deep learning pipeline in the cloud. That's a very long name, but I'm sure the talk will be very interesting. And we have a different type of events like today, which are uh, a bit less technical. They're more like conversational. Uh, we call them live podcasts. And today we have one of those uh, about MLOps. Then on uh, uh, next week on uh, Tuesday, where we usually have uh, uh, webinars we will again have a podcast about feature stores and uh, we'll again have a break uh, for the conference and in March we will come back with a topic of public speaking and then speaking about the conference the in February we will have uh, um, uh, a conference with uh, four tracks every Friday we will have uh, uh, four talks um, First Friday, we will talk about machine learning use cases. Then we will talk about product and process. Then we'll talk about career in data. And then finally, in the last on the last Friday, we will talk about machine learning in production. And this event is supported by our friends from uh, O'Reilly and MLOps community. And if you want to find out more about the event, go to this. Uh, you can just go to our website, datatalks.com, and you will find it there. Uh, for questions today, we will use uh, Slido. So you can use uh, either this link, which I'll post uh, now in chat, or you can just go to slider.com, enter DTC there. And uh, this way you'll be able to ask any questions today during our chat. And now let me let me share the link. I'll put it, I'll put it in the chat. So just go there and ask any question during um, the call. and. Uh, so I'm bringing up, um, pulling in some notes, and uh, we can start. Um, so today we will talk about MLOps, and we have a special guest today, uh, Theophilos Papapa Nagioto, and uh, Theo and I are colleagues. I work at Oelix Group, and Theo uh, works at the parent company of Oelix uh, Process. And in our company, Theo is the main advocate of MLOps. He is uh, usually the go person for everything related to machine learning and production, uh, model deployments, uh, tools for serving machine learning, Kubeflow, everything related to that. And I wanted to invite somebody to talk about MLOps. And it was very difficult for me to think of anyone else better suited for this chat than Theo. So thank you very much for coming to our event. Uh, welcome. Thanks, Alexei. It's my pleasure to be here. Yes. Um, before we get, go into our main topic uh, today of uh, about MLOps, uh, let's start with your background. Uh, can you tell us a bit about your journey so far? Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm an engineer, uh, so with a background of uh, working in telcos uh, for the last uh, 20 years. Uh, so I studied uh, computer science and uh, then I had the master's in data communications and finally a master's in AI. So uh, over in that journey of uh, 20 years I've been transitioning from a uh, Unix engineer to uh, data ops and to ML uh, engineering uh, the last uh, seven years, let's say. Okay, so you, you actually had two masters. Yes, I didn't finish the last one. I it's uh -huh. on, on going. Ah, you're, you're still studying. Yeah, I, did, I, I don't study anymore. I finished with uh, lectures like a couple of years ago, but uh -huh. there is still this thesis thing that I need to deliver. Ah, yeah, I know. It's, uh, <laughs> it usually <laughs> takes some time to do this. Yeah, to start, <laughs> even to start. <laughs> so, um, and uh, what do you do now? So uh, now I'm working in Process. Um, it's a... It's a company that is investing in other companies. We are working together on, uh, on some of them, on some projects. And uh, this company is investing mostly in uh, some segments like uh, food delivery and payments and uh, classifieds, uh, as well as uh, uh, edtech. 
So we are trying to, the, the, we have a team called the Process AI team and we are helping the data science teams of these companies to level up their uh, their level of uh, maturity in, in, in the space of machine learning operations. Mm -hmm. Like Coilix, for example, where yes. you help us to to do all these things related to, to MLOps. Yeah. Uh, so what is MLOps? Uh... Right. So uh, it, it's a buzzword these days. Uh, we exactly. were in this, uh, in, in this Twimmel conference and everyone was talking about MLOps. All the vendors that have a platform to sell were talking about this. So, and I remember that we had the same thing and the same feeling like 10 years ago when people started talking about DevOps and what is DevOps. Uh, but, and there are a lot of things. There is, it's, it's about the culture. It's about the, how people are working together and how they are they collaborating to solve a problem. But it's also about, of course, uh, processes and technology. So it's a set of best practices that uh, uh, helps people to deliver machine learning models in production and uh, not only deliver, but also maintain uh, effectively. Mm -hmm. And what is DevOps? It's so, also a set of best practices, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so the community or the industry realized that like 10 years ago, that uh, having uh, some barriers or some walls between the development uh, uh, department and, and an operational department is not helping with having fast iteration of delivering, uh, uh, of releasing software fast. And when you want to have a, a, a product that is uh, f uh, changing fast in order to deliver new features to your customer or to fix bugs, you have to uh, iterate fast. You have to release a lot of times a day. You have to minimize the, the amount of time that you spend from the moment that you will write a line of code till the moment that it will reach the production and start serving uh, customers. So this is DevOps, right? And uh, it's been uh, described over a time with different names as well. And the skill set of people that have been uh, working with that have, has, has been changing. Although to me, it's still the same, the Unix engineer or the system engineer that has been transitioning through different titles. And uh, cloud engineer also, I think now comes up pretty often that uh... Absolutely. Although we should also mention that there are differences on the fundamentals, like mm -hmm. uh, what is the software delivery workflow and what is the machine learning workflow, right? In the software space, you, you write code, you, you have some requirements and you, you deliver a piece of artifact that you deploy somewhere. And uh, this is different fundamentally from the machine learning workflow where a data scientist has to, to, to do some exploratory analysis first on the data and build a pipeline that will build a model based on some modeling activity. But the input of uh, the modeling or the training process, as we call it, is not just the code that the data scientist is writing. The input is also the data. And uh, the artifact that is being produced in that case is the, is the model. And that model has a life cycle, uh, which is not the same as the life cycle of a typical artifact from the software engineering world. In the software engineering world, uh, you, do, you have an artifact in a form of a container or in a form of uh, a binary file that you release or you deploy in a server. And after the tests have been executed in your Jenkins, let's say in your CI process, you, you, you have it uh, always running as long as there are no breaks in the connections with the, the other systems. Although in the space of the machine learning workflow, this is different. The model is, is not something that you will build and will work forever. Uh, the model is degrading over time uh, because the data are changing over time. I have a nice example that I like to use in, uh, in, our, in the company saying that when a new iPhone is coming every, every year, this class, needs, if, if you have a classifier that is, uh, that is identifying the model of the iPhone, let's say every year you will have to retrain the model that is doing this classification mm -hmm. because you have a new class in the data space. And that's why, for example, the model would degrade. And other examples that models are being retrained, for example, every day or every time you are performing an action to label some data set in your doorbell uh, from Nest or in your uh, car with a uh, with your, uh, I don't know, driving uh, models mm -hmm. that you might have. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the fundamental difference is that the model is degrading over time. And that's why uh, the monitoring of the of this uh, de deployed uh, artifact 
uh, has to be able to trigger uh, a retraining job, not just stay there and, and serve forever. Mm -hmm. so the, you will never have this in, in the software mm -hmm. engineering. So basically the main difference between uh, DevOps and MLOps is that uh, the life cycle is different. And then uh, because the input to a machine learning service is data, data changes over time. And it means that we need to watch, uh, uh, to look, uh, to look out and see, okay, if there are some changes, then we possibly need to trigger some things, right? And this is not something we have in DevOps, right? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. Of course, in DevOps, you, you you deploy an application, right? And mm -hmm. this application is following some rules. It's a rule-based software that is performing some action, and based on the tests in the in the unit and the functional test that you have written, you validate that the that the artifact is performing exactly the activity that you have described in your in your uh, requirements. But yes, with a model, this is different. It's not as, uh, as static as, as the software artifact. Mm -hmm. And uh, are there other uh, crucial differences between uh, the two, between DevOps and MLOps, in addition to, um, to these uh, so-called data drifts? Uh, is there something else? Yes, so uh, there is another thing. So if you remember from the, especially in, in the world of SREs, this this statement that is a foundation, that the monitoring is the foundation of, um, of, of, of the operation of SRE is uh, important. And the monitoring in the space of MLOps is even more important because you don't only need monitoring in order to, to serve to, to have a service that is performing as you described it. You also need monitoring in order to trigger these actions that you have described, the, the retraining action. So the monitoring is going to, to another level in the typical DevOps environment or in the typical software uh, environment, you, you would have service related metrics and business related metrics, like how many requests per second you receive and latency and I don't know. But in, in the space of machine learning, you might want also to to monitor some extra uh, things that you are also doing during training time, or even that you want to have only during inference time, for example, a uh, fairness or uh, anomaly detection, or I don't know, adversarial attacks on your model. Uh, in order to, uh, to to have such extended monitoring, you need components in your, in your workflow that are uh, not only retrieving all these logs and metrics that you are producing from your inference, but also uh, performing the action to, to kick off the, the training uh, pipeline. So are these tools uh, that we are talking about for monitoring, are they different from traditional DevOps tools? So for example, usually what we use is like Prometheus, Grafana, and things like that. Are they different in the MLOps uh, world or they are uh, similar or it's the same tools? So in, in, in a typical, in, in, a, in a software component, you are generating metrics in your Prometheus from uh, your, let's say, from, from your application itself. When when a class is being instantiated, you might want to increase a counter, or uh, when you are receiving a new request to a, to a particular uh, workflow of your application. In, but in in the ML, you want separate components that are receiving the data that you you are trying to infer, and also receiving the maybe the payload of the response, and uh, do comparisons with the rest of the data that you have. So you need a, a large infrastructure to, to to build and send such metrics in, in Prometheus. And of course, the, the tool set is the same. Prometheus is the, 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 the standard, let's say, metric system now, If like, like Graphite was 10 years ago. And, and Grafana is dominant in the space of, of visualization of dashboards for, for monitoring. But the component or the service that is going to generate these metrics is something new mm -hmm. and uh, it's something that should become uh, something reusable that people can utilize you, you can buy it you want to we want to have this commoditized you want to buy from a vendor or from the supermarket a, a component that's performing uh, in inference monitoring on a robustness of of your uh, of your model yeah mm -hmm. and why do we want to commoditize that uh, like uh, i know that it's uh it's a difficult thing, right, to, to, to deploy models, right? So this is why we want to make it as simple as possible, right? Yes, absolutely. So if we want to be able to iterate fast, we don't want to spend time and development effort on figuring out what are the special uh, 
metrics of each model that we need to have. We need to be able to automatically, let's say, if possible, uh, the, uh, identify this and pull them or plug them in the in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, I see often that there is a confusion uh, between ML engineering and ML ops. So, and often these terms now used as synonyms. And uh, I was wondering, uh, do you see, uh, like, are they different? And if they are, uh, what is the main difference between the two? Yeah, so ML engineering is a relatively new topic, the same as MLOps. And <clears throat> the same way that you would say software engineer and the DevOps or uh, something like this I, I, I could imagine so the the, the the role is the machine learning engineer and the melops is, is the practice of mm -hmm. uh, following the, the the best practices the roadmap let's say or some uh, maturity level uh, roadmap that is available out there mm -hmm. so ml engineer is the profession or the role and the melops is the practice of uh, of performing such, such a role with the rest of the departments of communicating with your business and your operations. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, uh, MLOps and operations, uh, um, I guess, like the, the people who are doing um, MLOps, who are they? Are they ML engineers or is uh, it's a set, like a special person uh, who we can call a MLOps engineer or uh, like if you want to, to make, uh, to, to do MLOps, what kind of role you want to look for? Well, uh, MLOps is the practice of, of mm -hmm. having the, th the three different uh, roles in an organization. So the business need, the uh, production operation and the development working together yeah? okay. and following the best practices like in the DevOps space. You have the developer, you have the operator, you have the business need. The business need define the metric or the SLA, SLO or SLI. So you define these metrics, you define what is my error budget and then in the space of uh, operator and developer, you have someone who is producing something and he's collaborating with the one who is consuming something as a customer. The, the operator is consuming the, the code that the developer wrote. In the space of MLOps, it's similar. You have the ML engineer who is, right, who is creating the model, is creating the pipeline, is maintaining it. And you have the operator who is uh, monitoring and operating the model and uh, making sure that the pipeline is working properly. Mm -hmm. And the business, uh, the product owner, or however you want to call him mm -hmm. or her, is that they are setting the, the requirements or the, the, the like service level. manager, right? Yeah, product manager, but not in the form of giving the requirements and mm -hmm. not even knowing who's here, who they are working with. It's about having a common team that they are working together, mm -hmm. maybe under the same manager even, if possible, that are... Uh, focusing on delivering something very particular, like a, a set of models. And this is the special team that is doing, let's say, the search in the organization. And this is the special team that is doing the recommendation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically a cross-functional team and everyone is working on solving uh, the same problem together yes, yes. as a one team. So not like uh, uh, developers do something, then throw it over the wall to the operational team and they, uh, they support it, but like everyone is working together. Yeah, and so that's like the culture uh, uh -huh. topic of uh, MLOps, and it's quite similar or even uh -huh. the same as the DevOps. So uh, ML uh, engineer is doing this, uh, uh, like has this uh, developer role, but who has this operator role in uh, in the MLOps world? How do we call these people? Well. You, you might you might have the same people who are performing this uh -huh, action. Okay. Yeah? If, you, if you have a small uh, functionally complete team that is doing this and uh, being responsible for what they are writing, and that's what the, lo the road that uh, Amazon led, for example, with the, the, the typical uh, two pizza teams saying that you build it and you run it, right? You have a team of, let's say, five people and a, a product owner that is uh, defining the inputs and outputs of the team or the interfaces, the API definitions and everything. And the developers are the same people who are also running it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you would say that uh, uh, having separate departments uh, in the past that were producing a model and uh, were operating the model, uh, you would expect that in the future you would have one common team that is performing this action as a functionally complete team. 
Um, is there such a thing like MLOps engineer as a role? No, like, I don't. Uh, in the same, in, okay, in the same way, like uh, let's say we have uh, site reliability engineers or uh, DevOps engineers. I also saw this title sometimes uh, popping up. Uh, yeah, I don't think that it will become a, a title. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe okay. because it's a fancy word now to to, mm -hmm. to use it. Yeah, it Some is. people will have it like a data scientist was uh, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, but mm -hmm. uh, I don't think this will become a, a, a role of a department. And mm -hmm. if it would be, that would be a shame because we've seen this also in some organizations trying to create a, ro or, or a role or even a team name called DevOps. Mm -hmm. They are missing the whole co concept of having DevOps, right? The whole concept is about having a common team that is performing this function rather than having different teams to communicate with each other over uh, an escalation path, let's say, with mm -hmm. different managers and operating silos. Okay, so we have a team and in the team we have three roles. We have the developer, then we have the operator, and then we have the, somebody from business, right? And uh, um, the developer is a machine learning engineer, right? So then this from business, we have a product owner or product manager, and operator is, uh, I guess we can, um, it can be like a site reliability engineer, right? Uh, and uh, I, I know that at Wilix we have um, uh, this role called site reliability engineer, and then in parentheses we say machine learning, but it means nothing else uh, but an SRE who will be working with an ML team. And uh, um, do, do you see these things coming up, uh, like some sort of specialization within this SRE uh, role? That, well yeah, that's a good question. Eventually, I think that uh, more and more people will jump into that role because uh, maintaining a, a, a model will become more uh, more adopted in organizations. Having machine learning models will become more like uh, not just a trend, but the, the de facto of how organizations operate as they are switching from process driven to uh, data driven to model driven organizations so uh, and that's the concept of democratization of the machine learning right you have your whole organization being able to utilize models uh, and even to build if if possible so more and more software engineers will come to become a machine learning engineers more and more data scientists will transition to that like they have transitioned from data mining experts or statisticians into that role and uh, yeah, so the software is the tool uh, to, to achieve what you want anyway. And the model can be also the tool in the future to achieve what you want as a as a function in an organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's say we want to find a place, a company that practices MLOps and we're looking for a job right now. Um, so I'm looking for a job. How do I recognize this from a job posting that this is uh, this role is an, M an MLOps role? Are there yeah. some keywords that I need to look uh, to do to, to find to look for? Well, the easy part is to look it on the skills required, right? Because, mm -hmm. because you, you can search in the requirements or the how do you call it the, the roles and the responsibilities of the of, yeah the responsibility of the role, but the, usually these are just sentences that uh, are fancy and uh, creating some uh, yeah some fuss about experience in MLOps. Right, and go <laughs> figure what it means, right? <laughs> yeah, but but if you, of course, if you start see names of tools like Kubeflow in the, mm -hmm. the skill set, or uh, I don't know, uh, machine learning pipelines, and even special uh, skills on uh, on components that are trending now in the space of uh, monitoring of machine learning models in the space of fairness detection and. Mm -hmm. uh, then of course you can understand that the, 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 there is there is a depth in the maturity, or they, they have reached some depth in the maturity of the MLOps. And maybe I can use this now to say that there is this article written by Google, and then there was an article written by Microsoft on the topic of maturity on the MLOps. And they have defined levels, each one of them. Uh, Google defined uh, three levels, 0, 1, 2, and Microsoft defined four, five levels, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And they describe with um, 
some bullets and uh, what are the requirements to achieve or to adopt uh, to, to, to mature in, in this uh, adoption of MLOps and even there is this MLOps uh, roadmap for 2020 and uh, to 2025 mm -hmm. which is describing all the uh, technologies that you should adopt in order to mature in that space so we didn't have this back uh, 10 years ago when we were defining devops we had a manifest or a manifesto of what is the devops and how we should collaborate but we didn't have such a nice uh, definition of how to mature and uh, i i appreciate that i, I can post references at the end mm -hmm. of the of the talk. maybe we can just uh, you can just quickly go over let's say we can take these three levels of maturity was it from google you said yeah there is one from google and one from microsoft yeah so the, like the one from google has three the one from microsoft has five right so probably yes. the one from microsoft is more detailed but the yeah. one from google uh like what kind of stages yes. they define? So, so they break it down into people, processes, and technology. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, like traditional maturity models in for an organization, and then they describe with bullets uh, what are the important things to have. Uh, so, in the in maturity level zero is when you don't have MLOps, which means that you have manual processes to 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 train a model, and you have manual processes to deploy a model, and you have someone who is monitoring the model, and maybe make take a decision after uh, comparing it with some data that they will receive from a, a data store to perform a training activity again by manual you mean it. like uh, running it in uh, jupyter notebook or something fancier i mean training for example uh, manual monitoring or the manual deployment? no no like model training uh uh, because I, I know that uh, for a fact that even uh, we at Wix sometimes do that where we have a model and then what we do to train it, we just uh, run a Jupyter notebook and then, you know, uh, run, run, run. Then at the end, you have a model. Yeah. You put it to S3 and, yeah. Uh, and even if you are not doing it in your laptop and you are doing it uh, in a cloud, let's, let's say in SageMaker, it's still a manual process, right? Mm -hmm. If you if you have to open, to start a notebook and uh, click it, click do uh, run the cells and, and 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 produce your artifact, and produce your model. So this is the manual process. This is the maturity level zero where mm -hmm. you don't have MLOps. Mm -hmm. You might have dev, DevOps, right? You might have CI there, and you might have that uh, the model is being picked up by S3 and you deploy uh, it's been deployed in a SageMaker endpoint and it's been uh, uh, made available, but you definitely don't have MLOps. Uh, and of course, there are other things there. You might have integration with an application that you might want to introduce. And this is also not something that you, you have automated in the uh, MLOps space, in the MLOps level zero. And then they describe the level one of maturity is when you are starting introducing some automation. You, you have, you are building a pipeline, and then you have the components of the pipeline that are doing the data validation that you are receiving in the in the nice way that the, the TensorFlow extended paper defined like three four years ago. You have uh, components that are uh, validating the data that you have received or the features, uh, whether they are according to the schema of the uh, data that you are expecting, and performing the training, having the valuation uh, component or the valuation module that is checking the, the, the criteria that you have set in order to promote it or to label it as the golden model that you will promote to production or you will uh, go for more testing to, to release it. And when you have a pipeline, this is an automation task that can level you up to maturity level one because mm -hmm. You spend less time on this, less friction between teams. The teams are working together and you have the data engineer who is producing the features working together with a machine learning engineer who is uh, maintaining the training job and maybe wakes up during the night to uh, fix a broken model uh, because it's also the role of the operator who the machine learning engineer should have uh, if we want to have this combined uh, MLOps role. Um, yeah. So, so basically, um, when we have when we train our model in Jupyter by clicking run run run, this is automation level zero. Once we move this from a uh, notebook to a script, and then there is some certain level of the automation when we don't do this uh, manually, but let's say there is some uh, training pipeline that we can uh, 
easily run, like let's say change some parameters, uh, hit enter, and then it just runs. Then this is a level one, right? Yes. And, and more things uh, that you are producing metrics that you are mm -hmm. observing and you make a decision to mm -hmm. uh, to hit the button in your uh, CI to, to do a retraining. Yeah? But still this, it's manual, right? So yes, it's manual, but you, you, you fetch maybe automatically your new features from your feature store if you have some data versioning system and etc. etc. So uh, that's the maturity level one. And then there is the, the vision. Yeah, the, the, the ultimate goal uh, that we should target. And that's the maturity level two in terms of Google, maturity level four in terms of Microsoft, which says that we have an automated retraining process. So the model is being monitored with all the metrics that we have mentioned in the past, with uh, uh, not only the service level metrics like uh, uh, latency and uh, number of requests, but uh, all, all these quality metrics about the, the fairness and the uh, robustness and uh, maybe even explainability topics that you want to have. And in order to detect whether your model is degrading, because this is a difficult problem. So having all these metrics in your, uh, uh, in your Prometheus, let's say, that are uh, checking the data drift and the, the model, the, the concept drift and all, all these sensors that you have around your ecosystem, uh, are triggering, so you have triggers, and these are triggering and the execution of a pipeline. Mm -hmm. And this is the maturity level two. And the triggering of the execution of the pipeline is a whole another is a whole another discussion because what we have been seeing in the last ten years of big data uh, was the scheduler that was the ultimate component that was periodically performing a, a, an action, maybe daily train a model or maybe uh, nightly every night uh, fetch the, create the new features from your orders uh, in of from your data set Th that was typically time driven execution time driven scheduling but now the the modern or the um, machine learning pipelines which are different than the the, 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 the data pipelines are should be um, data driven mm -hmm. should be able to be triggered by uh, your metrics, your threshold. So you define thresholds for your for the metrics that you have said, or even the threshold is something static. Eh? Even the threshold should be something that you can uh, create even a model to to identify when we we should trigger uh, the retraining. Because imagine having this being trained when you don't want it. So when you are setting up a, a data driven execution, you need special tooling for for that pipeline, and but then you you having you are having such quality problems uh, that you are facing as an organization that you are maturing even also on how the model is performing and that's why i think that this adoption or this maturity model will help organizations uh, get deeper and better into onboarding machine learning models so basically it will help not just directly jump on monitoring drift and having th faith in the model that it will uh, retrain itself and everything will be fine, but just gradually move from one step to another and change mindset in the meantime, right? Yes. And of course, the like in the, in the SRE, the foundation is the monitoring. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm vocal about this. We should take care of our models in production and not only take care but create new data out of how they are performing mm -hmm. because the monitoring is generating data it's not only the payload logging that you get the inference request and the inference response with the class names let's say you also want all the peripheral uh, explainability metrics uh, uh, fairness etc mm -hmm. yeah so i see that it's a, a change in mindset so we need to care about all these things before we can implement them but it also, I assume it requires some special tooling, some special tools. What are these tools like? What can we use to actually, to, to have MLOps, to, uh, to, to have all these things? Or what are the tools for this? Are, are there tools for, for that at all? Yes, of course. Uh, what I was uh, fascinated about in the uh, TwimelCon uh, this and last week was that there are so many vendors jumping on this train and using the buzzword MLOps to promote their uh, their solution, 
and good vendors that are focusing on the right direction, focusing on how to build systems that are triggering jobs, how to build monitoring tools and how to pr pr produce SDKs that are helping you build monitoring tools. And not only vendors, of course, there are plenty of open source software and uh, eco the whole ecosystem of Kubeflow is a, a collection of such tools. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's de facto that it should be Kubernetes based. Yeah, that's the, the that's the new Linux for me. Like, mm -hmm. like, like Linux dominated the world twenty years ago, and we still have it like nineteen something percent in our data centers. Kubernetes is the de facto way to manage workloads, and the way that you are doing machine learning on Kubernetes is today the, the Kubeflow is the the leading. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so this is the tool we should have like if we want to start implementing mlops in our, our organization then kubeflow is uh, let's say if we don't want to go to vendor we want to go with open source then kubeflow is the tool we want to to have right absolutely or but also vendors yeah mm -hmm. uh, the leading vendor right now in the kubeflow community is uh, aws and uh, mm -hmm. and microsoft together with google and uh, and, and seldon and, and other uh, great developers who are constantly delivering new functionality. Um, so the, the, the business is identified that by sharing their uh, capabilities on an ecosystem, they also promote their product. So as they are delivering uh, cloud services, let's say, they want to deliver cloud services which are based on pro a product that other people know. And when you are using SageMaker, maybe you are invoking a pipeline that in the back is a Kubeflow pipeline. When you are invoking, when you are deploying in in Google Cloud a, a model, an inference service, it might be a KF serving inference service. And when you are running a Jupyter in Azure, it might be running as a as a, as a, a Kubernetes pod uh, following the the, the, the Kubeflow uh, definition. Okay, maybe let's take a step back and talk about Kubeflow. What is it, and what? kind of what kind of components that we have in kubeflow yeah so uh, for, for me kubeflow is, is a what it's an ecosystem that is delivering an ml platform and if you jump on it you will start figuring out that there are components that you were not aware of and you might want to start using in your workflow mm -hmm. for example when we deployed uh, uh, some models last year in in the company we just focused on having a model that is servable Mm -hmm. that we can send in inference requests and get the responses. But then we have seen that with KF serving, which is the Kubeflow serving subcomponent, we have peripheral tools like the explainer and the transformer and the, um, the, the drift detector and the outlier detector. And now we have more and more components. And by utilizing them, we started building uh, metrics. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, Kubeflow is a a super set of components and the, for me the component i love the most is kf serving because i'm so uh, into the things that are in production but of course it's touching areas before the serving it's touching areas before the deployment the the, the big component of kubeflow is also the kubeflow pipelines which is uh, based on different schedulers you can have it with a uh, two different uh, uh, data driven schedulers the one is the argo cd from Intuit, and the other is the Tecton with K uh, from uh, from a fork from um, uh, K native. So, uh, and these pipelines are, uh, an, if you like, an, an implementation of the TFX, an implementation of the TensorFlow Extended. So, the, the paper that was sent was given to the public for for years ago from Google, saying that we should have component based. Uh, and data-driven uh, execution between the components with a pub-sub uh, type of relationship uh, led the way to have such a um, implementation, the Kubeflow pipelines. And then more and more tools are jumping. The, this popular uh, feature store uh, called Feast from Gojek is now also part of the community, has, has joined the ecosystem. And I wouldn't be surprised if this will be donated to uh, to a foundation at any moment soon. So, did I answer your question about Kubeflow, or would you like? Yeah. To... So I think, uh, 
so what I understood, so in Kubeflow, we have this uh, KF serving component that has also nice features in addition to just serving models. It also has nice features of detecting outliers, detecting drift. Uh, then we also, when we, in addition to that, there is another component, Kubeflow pipelines, which we use for building our training pipelines. And there is the third component, which is uh, uh, FIST, right? It's not yet part of Kubeflow as I understood but it's a feature store that we can use uh, when building our training pipelines. Yes, and other components. There is this uh, nice uh, tool for uh, hyperparameter optimization and uh, neural architecture search, which is called uh, uh, Catib. It was a Google uh, Visio, uh, Visio or something uh, product that was evolved to, to Catib. And Catib is, imagine describing in a YAML that you want to search that space for your uh, op optimal. Uh, so you define an optimization objective. As a data scientist, you want to train a model and achieve ninety nine percent accuracy. So that's your optimization objective, and then you define uh, the ranges of your hyperparameters. The same way that you are doing a grid search, and you say, I want my learning rate to to, to search values between zero zero one and zero zero two uh, with a step of this amount, and then it splits all these uh, different executions of the. Uh, search in into components or into pods or into containers, if you like, in the space of Docker and Kubernetes that are performing this training job with these parameters. And then they are producing a result. It's been reduced and then comparing in a nice visual view all the results to, to decide which model to promote. Hmm. And all these components, the, the nice thing that is that these components can be installed uh, as standalone components in your cluster without without having to have the full blown uh, cube flow. Although the beauty is that you can also have it full blow, fully blown. So mm -hmm. they you, they are they have tight integration. And there are there is this even, even this company called Aricto that has built this tool called Kale that is giving you the ability to transform your uh, notebook cells into containers. So <laughs> when you, you this you you build the whole pipeline in a, in a notebook and then when you click to play it's building containers of your cells to perform this activity and then you split it and send it to Katib for the hyperparameter search let's say and then deploy the best model beautiful stuff mm -hmm. and uh, you mentioned TFX uh, TensorFlow extended a couple of times did I understand correctly that Kubeflow is implementation of that paper uh, yes. Yes, um, they don't call it as such. Uh, uh -huh. Since the beginning, they were saying that uh, they don't see it as an externalization of Google uh, ML platform. But uh, this is what it is to me. <laughs> <laughs> and if you if you look at the TFX, so it's how to do production with TensorFlow is saying also that you can also do it with Airflow. Yeah, because Airflow is also a scheduler. You have uh, your DAG, you have your components, you, you are producing an artifact from each component and it's been used maybe for the input of the next uh, task. Uh, and similarly, you can also do it with Apache Beam, which is another software that is abstracting uh, your Spark or your Pandas or whatever uh, framework you're using for your data processing to perform such, such tasks. But uh, for me, the production or the enterprise level uh, system is Kubeflow. Mm -hmm. And if I want to learn Kubeflow, how, how can I do that? Mm. So uh, as a nice open source tool, it has a, a beautiful community. Yeah, I would advise to start from the website of Kubeflow. They, they have excellent documentation still being built. It's the, the, the documentation itself is open source, so you can extend it if you will find a problem. And uh, you can also join as a contributor to the project if you have an idea of improving something. Uh, the organization of Kubeflow has, uh, I don't know, 20 repositories of 20 different components and you can onboard and read the GitHub issues. Uh, if you have a problem, search the code and, uh, and figure out what's the, 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 the problem you are having if you, if you want to resolve the problem. Because it's becoming a more and more complex system, you will have more and more pro problems, as you can imagine. Uh, but it, it also has easy ways to start. There, there are two books already published about this uh, mm -hmm. from O'Reilly. There is a, uh, there are uh, YouTube videos where you can find for each individual component how to get started. There are 
uh, workshops delivered from its vendor. AWS, for example, has a workshop on Kubeflow. Uh, there is a special website for that. Uh, IBM created the Kubeflow Dojo, a set of uh, training uh, two days workshop specifying how to perform such different implementation and not only to install it but also to use it to get the tfx pipeline which is the to, sorry to get a tfx example with a taxi for example a taxi drivers if you remember mm -hmm. from uh, that was published uh, two years ago and build it in uh, in tecton pipelines in in kubeflow mm -hmm. yes and i i remember going through this myself and uh, uh we used aws and then in uh, there is a nice article in uh, kubeflow documentation end to end uh, set up on aws something like that and you just can follow this article and then you have a full-blown uh, kubeflow in your cluster right yeah okay and uh, uh there also like do you have maybe like in mind what kind of uh, an easy getting started project uh, one can do let's say they followed this tutorial they said they set up uh, kubeflow in their aws or google cloud or whatever and uh, yeah, you just want to learn this is there an easy uh, getting started guy like iris let's say in uh, machine learning yeah so the easiest way is to just start SageMaker and build the pipeline and mm -hmm. have fetch some features from the feature store and deploy it in endpoint because it gives you this uh, SageMaker studio that is doing all these things nicely the same way with uh, google cloud is also Kubeflow based, so the AI platform is when you are creating a model, you are creating an inference service. When you are creating a pipeline, you are creating a, a Kubeflow pipeline. So that's the easiest way. You consume it as a as a service from a cloud provider. Mm -hmm. But if you want to get deeper as a as a machine learning engineer and maintain okay. your own implementation from the open source tool rather than paying a vendor for that, you can install it uh, as you described from these nice uh, documents. Yeah, we also have a question about data versioning. Um, how much data versioning is important in MLOps? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in your opinion, it, it is important. The the data is the the, the raw <laughs> is the source of what you need in order to produce a model. You, you cannot produce a model without data. And as the data, as we, dis we discussed, there is the concept of data drift. So you want to retrain your model with a new data, but when you have new versions of your model, and then we are also introducing the concept of model versioning next to your code versioning and next to your data versioning, you have you want to have some type of uh, synchronization or a record of which version of model has used which version of data with which version of code. Because all these things, as you will start automating and to have automated retraining, you want to be able to review. You want to be able to go back because, I don't know, maybe due to privacy or GDPR issues, you would like to go back in time and figure out why this model gave this inference. Why did why did this model said that the, this customer should not get a, a loan from the bank? Yeah. So you need to go back to the model version that gave this prediction. You need to have the payload, of course. You need to go back from this model to map it to the data that you have used in order to train it to, to see which feature was important and for example see that uh, I don't know, the customer had another loan so that was another feature and because of that the importance of this feature said that this uh, model should infer that the customer should not get a, a loan so the tracking of the versions of the data of the code and the model usually is done in a system called the metadata uh, machine learning metadata store and uh, th this is good news the the, the tensorflow uh, team decided to work together with a kubeflow team and combine this project into one and build the mlmd system that is uh, no nothing more than a sql database with an api that is receiving metadata records when model is being generated or a data set is being created or a feature is being updated and uh, keeps a record for reference. Imagine having your uh, model degradation metrics in your uh, Prometheus that are annotated with a model version. Yeah, So you can see how it degrades each version and even if you are doing A-B testing between different model versions or I don't know, Bloom Green de deployment, you want to be able to see how different model versions are behaving. So having the ability to track back into the data that were used to produce this is important, crucial, but not part of 
the responsibility of the machine learning platform. The data versioning is the responsibility of the data platform. And okay. this is different. Yeah. So this is uh -huh. data ops, right? Or... Yeah, why not? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, data ops is, so the, we have been using the data already to build data driven organizations, right? For 15 years, 10 years, and built nice visual dashboards and uh, justify decisions based on data or even use data to make decisions even better. And uh, we have a lot of development and a lot of progress in the space of uh, of data processing. So all these data scientists and the data analysts that have been using the data platforms with data engineers have been doing this thing called uh, data ops, uh, which was brilliant. And we are moving on to the next step, let's say, to mm -hmm. MLOps as they are onboarding machine learning models now. Okay, so MLOps in a way is continuity continuation of data ops, which is also in a way continuation of DevOps that we had 10 years ago. Yeah, or, or different branches. Yeah, say. different branches, exactly, because we have data engineers, we have ML engineers, right? And then um, each has their own uh, specific set of uh, things they do uh, to become more efficient, right? Yeah, but I wouldn't be surprised if all these would merge under one title. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. We've seen the data scientist role becoming the one title to cover everything. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Uh, but it's probably now, uh, uh, well, let's see what happens with the data science title, but probably it will stop existing at some point, right? Yeah. Um, so there is a question about a demo, but we will not do a demo. This is like a podcast which will be released without video uh, eventually, so there will be no demo, sorry. Uh, Philippa is asking, uh, do you have any experience in deploying models on mobile apps offline? And does it make sense to use Kubeflow in this in this case? And if not, which kind of tool exists for this uh, for this uh, case? So, uh, as far as I'm aware, most of the deployments of these models in the apps are uh, manual 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 processes. Although the good news is that the vendors have realized that with the uh, adoption of 5G, the mobile devices will become just edge devices, like a, I don't know, a CDN node that is delivering video. So they are extending Kubernetes into the edge and a, a, a mobile device can be a Kubernetes node that is performing, uh, that is running containers. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we have, <laughs> <that's very laughs> yeah, funny. why not, right? <laughs> it's the data center in the mobile. <laughs> so, uh, Imagine this, and, and, and Microsoft, for example, ha, ha, has this leaf, is it called, or I don't remember, but the, the, the mobile device is a, a, a receiving containers. They have, so the scheduler is also considering the mobile device to receive a new version of the application or a new version of the model. So here we are, as this will become more and more fast, the, the line or the, the, the phone line and the phone capability in terms of processing, it would be able to handle loads in such a way to serve models individually. And, and in that, the retraining, it will be even more important because you will have personalized, you, we already have personalized models, yeah? The doorbell model I have for my nest is personalized according to the people who are coming to my house and I'm tagging them with their faces. And every time I'm tagging the face of someone as my friend, then the model is detecting him and is saying that, I don't know, your friend is in the door. So he's, he's telling me his name. So this model has been retrained so often. So, yeah. So this is something you have at, uh, in your home, right? You have this model. Well, I don't even know how this model works, but that's uh -huh. why I assume it's an image detect it's a, it's a detection model. It's uh -huh. getting an image of someone who is re ringing my doorbell and is saying, oh, this is your wife or this is your, your kid, that kid. Mm -hmm. And every time there is a new face, I have uh, in my list of faces uh, uh, an option to tag them in order mm -hmm. to improve the model or to create a new class of a new person that is a new friend of mine and the, mod the doorbell has never seen them before. So if I have this in my... So imagine how this will become more and more uh, democratized. Yeah? Uh -huh. yeah, that's interesting. We have a question from Howard. Uh, it's not related to your doorbell model, but it's uh, interesting also. Do you think we'll see an MLOps manifesto anytime soon? Uh, we, we briefly talked about this. Eh? It's not the, the, there was a DevOps manifesto, and I think the equivalent of DevOps manifesto these days is the uh, 
the, the two articles of Microsoft and Google on uh, MLOps maturity level or MLOps maturity model. And uh, of course, the nice work of the, the Continuous Delivery Foundation from uh, CNCF, from Linux Foundation, on uh, MLOps roadmap for 2025. So for the next five years, what an organization should do to reach uh, the maturity level that is described in the, the, the papers. Okay. With Thank details, you. this is how you should track fairness and this is how you should uh, retrain the model, etc. Yeah, we will ask you to share the links uh, so later uh, our listeners can can read. There is an interesting question that uh, caught my attention. Would you recommend learning Kubeflow? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yes. Even for the data scientist, right? Because even, even for the machine learning engineer, it's not just using it. It's about extending it. We've seen so many uh, people getting interested in this uh, popular uh, uh, GitHub project called TensorFlow, right? And everyone contributed the, the, the implementation of their paper in TensorFlow or in PyTorch over the last 10 years, the last five, especially over the last five years. Uh, why shouldn't we see the same in the space of... Uh, of uh, engineering and and the same way that we had Airflow so successful in the space of data uh, uh, orchestration, we should have the same for the ML orchestration. We should have a good representation of engineers contributing to the to the Kubeflow project. It's a welcoming community. We have uh, I don't know, ten meeting meetings every week about if it's different component, and uh, everyone is welcome to join. And there is also Slack, right? Yes, of course. Yes, like, uh, I think it's quite uh, a large community. I, I'm also in that Slack. It's almost like five thousand people, right? Or like it's yeah. pretty large. Well, not that large as the Kubernetes community, right? If you go to the <laughs> Slack, it's like six digits, six digits already. Well, but still, there is uh, uh, probably in a couple of years it will get there. Yeah. Um, what do you think makes MLOps easier? Is it uh, probably the question uh, is like how MLOps uh, helps to make things easier? Um, like why should we even adopt that? And uh, what should we uh, do? Like, does it make it easier to monitor things, to debug, or what are the benefits? Yeah, so I think I briefly mentioned that the technology is still the enabler for progress. Yeah. So as as we have uh, learned about experiment about explainability and uh, de uh, anomaly detection because we have tried we have tried the, the the serving, the same that's how we got experienced into other components that we were not looking for. Yeah. So when you get exposure to a new tool that is not only giving you what you want but also the other things that you don't know yet, this is how you you get progress, especially with and new, new tools. So this is, this is what makes the technology an enabler. And uh, MLOps is something you need to adopt as an organization because it will help you become a model-driven organization. It will help you replace uh, functions that are manually that are manually done with automation, mm -hmm. or even improve, or even build products based on models. And there are so many businesses already having model-based products. Mm -hmm. And we have a somewhat related question about that. And you also mentioned uh, a tip, right? This is AutoML uh, tool from Kubeflow. Yes. Will AutoML kill data science role? Is there any risk uh, for that? Well, not kill, but commoditize. <laughs> commoditize, yeah. okay. We, why should we have the, the PhD level expert to, to tune all these parameters if you can? That's what we had in the past, right? Mm -hmm. yes, One exactly. of the tasks of the data scientist or the who was also a PhD uh, level uh, employee had uh, to search in the space of hyperparameters on wh what optimal combination is giving him the best results for his model, and this has been replaced by already by by the search uh, capability, and not that but that didn't give them. Uh, that didn't send them away from the jobs, that kept them in the jobs and make them more productive. Mm -hmm. So the data scientists will become more productive with AutoML, will become more productive with ML platforms, and they will have to worry about more mature uh, uh, problems like 
which other metrics should I introduce in my uh, fairness detection? Mm -hmm. Should I also worry about uh, how the model is going to perform to data that we haven't seen yet and things like that? Mm -hmm. So the role of a data scientist is not at least, at least uh, uh, like unless the only thing uh, the data scientist does is uh, tuning models, right? In the, in the space of cut tip. Yeah, okay. Uh, remember, we also spent a lot of time also in OLX and uh, in other companies on deploying. Mm -hmm. And see how easy it is now with KF serving. You, you just say, this is my S3 location of my model, mm -hmm. and that's the name of a model. And bam, you have an API endpoint, which you can start consuming. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple of years ago, we would need to spend... Uh at least a week to actually, uh, you know, build all this uh, web service, put the model there, um, create deployment in Kubernetes, create a service. Then Se secure it. Secure monitor. it, exactly. Then uh, add uh, metrics, uh, then at auto scaling, and then uh, have an SRE uh, sitting there tuning the model, tuning, not sorry, not the model, but auto scaling and all that. So yeah. now it's indeed a lot simpler. Yeah, exactly. and, and 20 years ago was <laughs> we need to order some servers and wrap yeah, exactly. them and put the cable. I have been doing this. That's why I'm saying this <laughs> because I see this uh, this progress and that's 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 good to to abstract more and more the uh, the work that you have been doing in the past and evolve into more high level uh, uh, tasks. We still have two more questions. Do you have time to to answer them? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So one question is, how can a small team build fully automated MLOps uh, operations? It seems to me like only big teams can do that. Is it true in your opinion? Well, we have experience to share with this. Uh, remember, it was uh, a couple of people or maybe three people in our organization and your company that we have worked together to, to, to put like five, ten models in a, in the KF serving and release it, and it took us it took us two hours to install it, and uh, deployment was also a few minutes. Uh, so even just just using one part of the component is simple, and if you want also the full blown, then you get it. Dep it depends. It will give you the ability to spend more time on it because it will also give you the ability to do more stuff with it. Yeah. So if a small team is if a small team of three people is all only spending time to to build a model and release it and how, and spend time on monitoring imagine how more productive this team would be if they would have all these functions already available in form of services mm -hmm. and they would worry about how to speak to the business to ask for on how to improve the model and make it better mm -hmm. Uh, but when uh, like it's also uh, related to teams but when teams are Siloed, a uh, siloed, uh, like when, when teams are isolated, uh, with different languages, different use cases, uh, manual experiment tracking. How would you recommend these teams uh, to start uh, moving in the MLOps direction? Well, the good news is that these things are uh, language agnostic. Yeah, so. Of course, there should be silos in the organization, especially based on language. Yeah. Uh, at least the development department should be uh, working together. Uh, but the tool, the tooling is already helping with that. It's another topic. It's the culture topic of uh, MLOps or even DevOps. How do you make uh, an organization that is not based on silos? But you will always have the, the force moving towards that direction, build silos, because politics play a role and people uh, are... That's a normal thing for human beings to, to build silos around to protect their area, to peace around their, their, their territory. But uh, the technology is helping here because it's also agnostic to the language. For example, the Tecton pipelines, or even in general, the pipelines, is an, is an SDK that is helping you build uh, a YAML definition of uh, the, com the components. And that's the difference also with Airflow, for example. In Airflow, you have Python only, mm -hmm. and your, your tasks should be Python-based, and all the tasks should be Python-based. In a pipeline that is gen just invoking containers, imagine that each container can be in a separate language. So the container that is doing the data validation and built by the data department, let's say, can be uh, written in Scala, and the, the container that is doing the training can be written in Python with PyTorch. So 
on this pipeline is invoking those different components, is getting the artifacts that are produced from the previous, uh, is, and whatever is subscribed to that is pulling it to move to the next step. Mm -hmm. So the technology is also helping if you have a silent organization, as you said in the question, in the form of using different languages, that's not a barrier anymore. You don't have to onboard everyone to learn Scala or Python. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. Yeah, we don't have any more questions. So thank you very much for coming today. Um, do you have many, maybe any last words? Uh, no, it's been my pleasure uh, talking to you, Alexei, and the audience. I will send the links to yes, the maturity please. models and the roadmap in the, mm -hmm. in the chat. Yes, we can share them in Slack, and then I'll put also them in comments in YouTube and um, uh, podcasts. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming, for sharing your knowledge, your experience with us. And thanks everyone for attending this uh, this talk today. Thanks, Alexei.